part of the, that's part of our culture for being hard work, hard work. And granted, I think we should find a balance between we should find a balance between being hard working, but also being um, relaxed. But you know, it's kind of hard. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I think it depends on what you do too. Like, you know, there are some some people are so in love with their job that they can kind of they're in a good mood while they're working. You know, like it doesn't stress out them out to work more. It actually makes them happier. Mm-hmm. And then there are some jobs where it's just like inherently stressful. So it, I think it's it just kind of depends. That's interesting. You say that. In- say that again. Inherently stressful. Yeah, like. Like, even if you love, even if you love your job, there are some jobs that are just going to make you stressed out, even if you like it. Like, I don't know, I I can imagine if you work on Wall Street or something, like in stock, like, even if you love being in in that, you know, field, it's going to be stressful. It's going to be, like, high energy and intense all the time, and you're going to, like, need a break. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like, I think a lot of the more social jobs, actually, social jobs can be stressful, too, depending on who you're working with. But, um, you know, like, I find for me, when I'm working with refugees, that's one of the things that I love to do. And, like, even though I know some people would find it, like, kind of frustrating because you can't always help them the way you want to, it just always makes me more energetic afterwards. Like, anytime I hang out with my refugee friends to, like, give them advice about, like, where, you know, like, stuff they're doing in school or, like, I help them go to the doctor's office or, like, whatever, and I and I come come back home and I'm, like, I feel amazing. Like, I wish I could do this every day. So mm. I think it just kind of, you know, it depends on what you're doing and, and how much you enjoy it. And, yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. See, and I, lo- I love hearing that from people. I love seeing people like that who found their passion and what they want to do. And mm-hmm. that's just amazing. That's just amazing to me. I love that. I I think I agree with you on that too. I think it's funny because you have you have this you have a job right, like the job that you're doing, and to you you feel happy, you feel amazed by doing it. But then you'll have somebody else who thinks it's the most stressful job in the world. They can't imagine doing it every day, or if they are doing it, they hate it. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think it's totally okay for some people to find you know for people to have different reactions to the same job. Like, you know, if you don't like working with refugees, like, it's it's understandable. Find something else that you love doing that helps people besides working with refugees, you know? Like, there's some quote that I see a lot on Facebook that says, don't ask what the world um, needs and do it. Instead, ask what makes you come alive and do that because you'll come alive. And I really like that quote uh, because it's true, like, if you are doing a job that you hate because you think it'll help people, like if you're a doctor but you hate being a doctor and you're grumpy all the time and it's like affecting your decisions, you're not actually helping people. I know? meet a lot of doctors like that. I've met yeah. a lot of doctors like that. Like it, the world would be better off if you were not a doctor in that situation and you picked something else that, you know, you you would throw all of your passion into. So, you, so yeah. You, you know, man... Uh, I, I got. I got to be careful because you say stuff, and this I can end up turning this into a fifty-five hour conversation. There was a. There was a. Um, <clears throat> me and this one girl we were having a discussion. We we're talking about following your passions and versus following like money or chasing your whatever whatnot. And I was telling her, it's always going to be harder to change it. Like people always, I always identify the idea of your passion as being something that's like some crazy ass idealistic goal, like being a singer or something like that. And I said, mm-hmm. when you chase your passion, it's always going to be harder than chasing money because when you're chasing your passion, you're naturally going to create goals in your mind that seem unrealistic. As mm-hmm. you become a teacher, as you start going out and teaching and going to different countries, when you start building connections with these people, you're naturally you're naturally going to create goals in your mind that is going to be impossible to accomplish to somebody else even like how your dad's how you said your dad's a pediatrician and he wanted to go to bosnia and help people that sounds so fucking crazy to somebody who's a regular person i think it's great i think it's amazing but that's because that's how my mind thinks i think on that type of level but most people would think that's crazy like what the fuck who do you think you are dr phil fucking going yeah, to damn there totally people who thought that too <laughs> like so but it, but that's because that's its passion when it's your passion you're going to think big versus when if it's your money you're just gonna think okay let me just do just enough to get by let me do just enough to get me a check let me do just enough to get by 
And I meet a lot of doctors like that. I meet a lot of construction workers like that. I'm doing a side job at this one construction site that's building a stadium in Sacramento. I met a guy who makes $300,000 a year, plus overtime when he can. And he hates his job so much. Like, he's just depressed all the time. And I'm thinking he should be happy because you're making $300,000 a, $1, a year. Hell, that payout. Yeah. But he he said, man, I hate this job, man. He just because he said, I, I can't wait to retire. I was like, and I told him, well, if you retire, you can do something else. He was like, man, this is all I know how to do. This is all I spent my life doing. I'm 40 years old. There was nothing else I knew how to do. So That's rough. So it's, it's interesting, man. That's really interesting on that aspect. I, I said that to say this. Save the world, Jessica. Save the world. <laughs> that's the plan. <laughs> I mean, well, that's another thing that I, like a kind of idea that I've seen floating around that I really like is is the idea that, like, you know, to save the world and, like, to make a difference, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to leave where you are. I mean, that's that's effective and it's like one way to do it but you can stay right in the community that you were born in if you want to and if you are passionate about what you're doing and you're you know dedicated to it that's still changing the world it's changing the part of the world that you're already in you know like if everyone if everyone works hard where they're at that would change the world you know if every person did that so you don't have to compare yourself to the people who do move across the globe or like are the ceo of a huge company or whatever like you know, anyone who's who's passionate and dedicated is making a difference. So that's true. And I mean, I am interested in traveling around and working in different places, but you know, I'm also totally fine with the fact that I'm probably my permanent home is probably going to be in Arizona or or maybe Colorado. I, I really you never know. You you never know your passion when you when you're following your passion. <laughs> yeah. your, your passion might take you. You never know. You never. That's why I always keep saying when you fight, when you're fighting on your passion, when you're waging war on your passion, you never know where it's going to take you at. You know, you you just never know because the work ethic is going to your work ethic is going to be different. This is just, a, just yeah, a different thing. That's totally true. Uh, you might end up in Hawaii someday, and where might end up being a trans, <laughs> might end up being a translator for a Colombian drug lord's daughter. That'd be a funny <laughs> thing. I just thought about that. Oh man, I don't know. All the drug lords in Mexico now, like Colombia and Mexico, traded places. So, <laughs> oh yeah. Which <laughs> now that you think, now that I think about that, since you kind of have a, um, you have a, I think you, I think you really have a more deeper experience than I have, more extensive experience I have with different cultures. Um, and this is kind of left field, so you can you can kind of ignore this question if you want to. Lately in the news, you know, because of the bombings, we've been, ah, it cut off again. I swear to God, I'm buying a new fucking phone. Okay, it's back. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, I late, can hear you, but your, yeah, your face is like frozen. Okay, now it's, now it's better. Okay. I'm just going to keep moving. So anyway, lately, um, <laughs> lately in the news, well, not lately, I say for the last few years, we've been having... The news and the media has published a very negative opinion on people of Middle Eastern descent, people who are Muslim. And, you know, it's, pro it's partly because of, you know, the bombings we've been having, you know, like the situation that happened in New Jersey, the situation that happened in New York this week, or um, the, the ISIS attacks that's been going on. And I'm bringing this up because lately I've been arguing with like a lot of people how... You can't blame everybody who's Muslim. You can't blame everybody who's Middle Eastern just because they look similar to the people who are doing it. Or, you know, it's like this, this whole popular prejudice against people who are of Muslim faith and people who are Middle Eastern descent. Even with Donald Trump saying he wants to put a ban on all Muslims coming to this country. Yeah. So I wanted to ask, how do you feel about that? Like, what's your opinion about that? Yeah, I, I mean, obviously it's really a really touchy and complicated subject, but I definitely agree with you. Like you can't generalize millions and millions of people and put them all in one box, you know, like, like people who actually support terrorism are a small percentage of, of the Muslim population of the world. Obviously. I mean, anyone, anyone who actually wants to educate themselves on Islam knows that, you know? Right. And I mean, and uh, to be perfectly honest, um, I'm, 
I'm very skeptical about, like, um, the religious texts of Islam. Like, there's a lot of stuff in there that I do have a problem with. But, um, but you know, people have hundreds of different ways to interpret those texts. So even if there's something in there that to one person looks like it encourages violence, another person could say, no, it's not encouraging violence, it's in this very specific context, and I don't believe it means that. And, I mean, that's what happens with Christianity, too, you know? There are people who justify the Crusades using the Bible, Mm -hmm. and then there's people now who are like, no, like, Jesus would never encourage murdering people, you know? Like, people can, can change a text to mean whatever they want, and so... So I think the Muslim world is, like, hugely diverse. There's all kinds of ways to interpret Islam, and most of them don't include, you know, bombing people. So. <laughs> <laughs> but they, even, they didn't even have bombs when the the <laughs> it was created. Right. <laughs> or, or stabbing people or whatever. Hey, you know, hey um, 1,000 year, 1, years into the future, you're going to find <laughs> balls that set shit on fire, and you're going to bomb people. You're going to throw these at people. Jesus. Wait. Oh, wait until it. Jesus, please let this camera work. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, it's working now. Yeah. Um. And like through my when I was a conversation partner, I, I actually it became my job, and I got paid for it eventually and stuff for for a little over a year. And so I had like whole groups that I would uh, talk to where everyone in the group was from Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. and which is like a very conservative Muslim country, you know, it's it, like their government is one of the more extreme and, and I have issues with it. I mean, like they have sexist laws, like up until recently women weren't allowed to drive and they have punishments that aren't really humane there and that sort of thing. So it's not like I think, you know, Islam is a perfect religion or something, but the people that I met who are coming from Saudi Arabia, they were wonderful people, you know, like um, they were totally open-minded to, learning from other perspectives like i had a super interesting conversation with this one lady from saudi arabia and she was telling me about how she used to believe like she believes that there's one uh one truth you know like there are moral absolutes that are just right they're the, they're right for everyone and mm-hmm. if you disagree with them you're wrong you know which i mean a lot of religions teach that and That's she used to believe, yeah um she used to believe that you know they should be enforced by law, like that religious truth should be enforced by law and everyone should have to believe in them. Um, and then she came to the United States and she changed her mind. And she now she believes that, you know, she still believes those those religious truths are, are true, that they're the only right answer, but she still believes people should be free to believe in them or not. And so I think that just goes to show you how, you know, people are complex. You can't just, like, put them in a box you can't say, oh, all Muslims fit into this one characteristic and that's it. You know, people change, people people are open to hearing new ideas. And, and but, like, obviously she was not, you know, she was not an ISIS supporter. She was <laughs> not, you know, like, nothing like that. Nothing like what, you know, Donald Trump's sort of rhetoric would, would say that she would have been. So, um, you know... I think it's super important to recognize the complexity of other cultures. I don't think we should be naive, but when you really look at it and really educate yourself, there's, I mean, Muslims are are human and complicated like everyone else. It's just the way it is. I think it's exactly what you said is, I think, like I said, you can't, you can't define them all in one box. That's impossible. It's too big of a following. And, the interesting thing about a lot of those terrorist groups I always say is they're terribly wrong for what they did. They're wrong. They're terrible groups. But it's interesting to see how all of them really think they're doing the right thing. And it's interesting to see how powerful it can be, how powerful a following can be when you attach it to a religious belief. You know, like in yeah. the United States, I don't know if you've ever heard of this. We have one group here called the Nation of Islam. It's like the black version of Islam. But, oh, really? But, yeah, it's a long story. Well, I, I can narrow it down. You ever heard of Malcolm X? Yeah. Okay, so the Nation of Islam started, like, about a hundred, like 60, 70 years before him. But it started on the basis of this guy believed in, he was a Muslim, a black guy. He believed in Islam. But what he did was he took the Islamic text and he flipped it around and said that, 
black people were all the original man and that the white people, white people were created from this evil scientist called, um, Shakub, Shakub and were in, it's like, it's like this whole thing, but in his situation, he took the Islamic faith and he attached it to the ideal of at that time, you know, we just became free, but there was still a lot of oppression against black people. It still is today, but it was, it was way bad back then. So at that time, it made sense to them. It made sense yeah. to say that, oh, the white man's the devil, the white man's this. Now, of course, I don't believe that. I think that's retarded. But at the time, it made sense. And they haven't changed the context on that even to this day. Islam, in fact, regular Islam, like regular people who in the top societies of Islam don't recognize them as a following of Islam. Just like they don't recognize ISIS, just like they don't recognize Al-Qaeda, just like they don't recognize Taliban. But it's interesting to see that in their minds, they think they're doing the right thing. Because they're, respond they're responding to... How can I put this in a way where it doesn't sound crazy? In their mind, they're responding to, they're responding to the same issue that I think they all, they all have this connection where they feel like the United States has oppressed them. Whether it was the black people in the nation of Islam, whether it was the Middle Eastern people who started ISIS, whether it was this other group, Taliban, Al Qaeda, they feel like the United States has oppressed them. And when you look back in history, you see that's kind of has happened a couple of times where you know, it's just, it's just kind of weird. Like, we, we live in a day and age nowadays where there's really no kind of... You know, I remember when you used to watch a movie like the um, Cinderella and like Aladdin, you had the bad character and he just was bad and that was it. There was yeah. no... that He was just bad and that was exactly it. There was no... He was never a good guy. There was never anything did to him. He just was a bad guy and that was it. Mm -hmm. It's strange because yeah. we, we live in a day and age where it's not like that anymore. And I support yeah. the United States. I love the United States. I love my country. I fuck with my language. I F with my people. I love them to death. But I think the dirt that we've done in the past is kind of what's bringing back the karma that we're going through right now. Yeah. And I mean, I I really like how you, you said, like, you love your country and you're still recognizing what we did wrong. Because the truth is, like, there's no such thing as a perfect country. And mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of Americans... They're afraid that if they admit that the United States ever did anything wrong, then that makes them, like, not patriotic and it makes them a bad citizen. And mm -hmm. that's so not true. Like, actually, it's better for your country if you recognize its problems because it can help you fix them. Right. And the rest, yeah, and the rest of the world will respect you more if you admit to your mistakes, you know? So I think it's, it's actually more patriotic to to admit those things i mean not that we like we shouldn't spend all of our time criticizing the country and never acknowledge any of the good things we've done but but there's definitely a place for acknowledging what we've done wrong and i think it's really important right we're only we're only we're, we're so we're so progressive of a nation because we've always done that women yeah. women didn't have re, women didn't women didn't have real rights into the last 80 to 90 years there used to be a time where you really could just beat up on a woman and that was normal yeah. So I'm um, that, and that's that was not that's not it wasn't that long ago. So we're always we've always been progressive because we noticed things like that with women's rights, with um, with slavery, with the way we treated Irish people, with the way we the way we had certain civil rights issues. We've always been a progressive nation because we always would see an issue with that and be like, okay, you know what? That doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. Like even like with the dude, you heard about the whole thing with um, Colin Kaepernick protesting against the flag or Mr. Yeah. Neely. I said the reason why I didn't have an issue with that is because, to me, he's not fighting the people. He's fighting the system. And the United States has always been a country that was made great by the people, not by the system. The government's yeah. always kind of got it. The government's always unanimously, for the last 400 years, we've been a country. Well, 300. No, how is it 300? How long, how long have we been a country? Like, I think it's 240? 200. Yeah, that sounds right. About 240. We've always, we've, we've always been a progressive country because people kept fighting for it, not the system. The government has always published laws that kind of fucked up over, fucked over one group of people while profiting for another, pro profited by fucking over another group. But it's always been people who said, you know what? That's not right. We're going to fight. We're going to fight for our rights. So yeah. I respect them for that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, yeah. I got to drink water. I'm drinking, I got to drink some water. But, um, yeah, that was my opinion about that. Um, do you ever have these discussions? When this is actually something I really wanted to ask you. When you're talking to people from different countries, and you know they have, I know a lot of people have their opinions about America that are different from yours. I mean, I've had, I had a lot of conversations with a lot of Brazilians who felt certain type of ways about what happens here. What can you say are some of the most interesting conversations that you have with somebody 
from a different country about here? Hmm. That's, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I didn't get into, um, the politics as much, um, with like the people that I met at ASU because a lot of times, like I was, I was supposed to be just helping them with English and like getting into a heated political discussion would, would be like, (laughs) you know, like I was representing, you know, my job and stuff. So I wasn't supposed to do that. But, um, Jessica, uh, Jessica, did you, did you tell, did you tell them that they were wrong? Did you tell them that their government (laughs) was full of shit? Jessica, you can't do that. (laughs) Yeah. So, so we kind of, we tended to avoid those subjects, but, um, but with, actually I have one friend from Mexico Mm. and he would always be, he would kind of slip in there like randomly when we were having a conversation about something else, he'd be like, so, you know, all of Mexico's problems are caused by the U.S., but anyway, we don't need to talk about that. <laughs> so, okay, you know, okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, and and so, and actually, that made me really curious. I still haven't read enough about the subject to know, like, my own full opinion, but, like, um, we did some messed up stuff to Mexico. Like, that's definitely true. And, and in Central America, you know, like, we, the United States has interfered in ways that were not helpful, and... You know, and we don't really learn about that um, in in history class. At least I never did. Like, Shoot, no, we never do. We yeah. never do. And and I don't necessarily think that everything that's wrong with Mexico right now is all because of the U.S. I'm sure it's more complicated than that. But I don't think that we, you know, were helping them the whole time. I think we were at least part of the problem some of the time. So, and I wish that I wish that we as a society were more educated about that kind of thing because I. You know, I felt like, why am I just learning about this in college? Like, this should be something I already knew about, you know? So. One thing you learn about the United States when you read on our history, like really read our history, most countries that we've, most countries that we've helped, we've also hurt in the process. Mm-hmm. We might have come hurting first, then helping, or we might have come helping first and hurting along the process. But we always do that. It just is what it is. Hell, I didn't even know when we went to the V. I didn't know. Uh, oh. Yeah. Oh, this thing cuts off one more time. I swear to God. Like, I could ever go. Okay, I'm back. Like, I didn't even know that we actually lost the Vietnam War until like two years ago. I always thought we won. Jesus. 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 God. I want this 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 phone to work. You know I don't get paid until tomorrow, God. You know I don't got money to get a new phone until tomorrow. Oh, okay, we're back now. Okay, there we go. Can you hear me? <laughs> Yay. Okay, yeah, sorry. Me and I Guy have, have a conversation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of choppy, but Okay, hello, can you hear me better? Yeah, I can't hear you anymore. Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Okay, okay, there we go. That was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not the best singer, but continue. Hello. Okay, G. Okay, go. Okay. Maybe God's sending you a message. Maybe she's not answering. <laughs> okay, there's a. I never actually asked you about that. What is your um? What you're Catholic, right? Uh no. So I'm actually Protestant. Um, and the rest of my family is too. Um, I I mean, and I'm, I'm not just Protestant because I was raised that way. I I believe in it personally too. But it definitely was was a huge part of my childhood. Um, you know, being homeschooled, like it's a pretty, you know, I live close with my family and my my mom. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Jesus, Jesus. Okay, there we go. We're back. <laughs> okay. Uh, did it cut out, like, while I was talking? Yeah, it, it cut out right when you said um, you are about to buy me Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. 
But go ahead. Uh, <laughs> no, but it cut out when you were talking about, um, you know, being homeschooled. Yeah. So my mom was involved in my life every single day, all day, for you know, until I was in ninth grade. And even then, she was still a stay-at-home mom, so I'd see her as soon as I got home. So, like, and she would always, you know, teach me about what she believed. She was... Um, like, you know how we were talking about grandparents who always give you, like, these with, like, wise sayings and mm-hmm. stuff? I mean, she's like that, except she loves to use analogies. So she has an analogy for, like, every situation or, like, a Bible story that relates to every situation. And so, mm. um, so I really was, you know, educated on my own faith, I guess, a lot when I was growing up. Um, my yeah. grandmother is, um, my grandmother is actually a, the evangelist at her church. She's Pentecostal. So I know how that feels. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, my cousins are Pentecostal. So, woo <laughs> Interesting. Are they, or are they black? No, uh, they're white. They're, like, they live in California. I don't know. There's a lot of, like, the more charismatic churches, like, in L.A. and stuff that they go to. Um, I guess it, there's different types of Pentecostal. But, but yeah, like, you know, they're all, like, the more outgoing kind of uh, charismatic <laughs> side. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's Pentecostal. That's the one you go to church. They do that. Dun, 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 dun. That's the one you go to. You go to a Pentecostal, you, Pentecostal and Baptist. You go to a Pentecostal Baptist church. You dancing that. You dancing that Sunday morning. It's dun, 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 dun. Yeah, I mean, I I ask I ask because um. I don't know. My family's Pentecostal, but I'm going through that phase where I've really been trying to figure out, you know, my own faith. You know, um, and it is what it is. You know, I don't know. That's just my phase. I mean, yeah. I mean, everybody's got to go through that because, I, personally, I think that you have to decide for yourself what you believe. You know, like like even if you're raised in a certain faith, when you get to a certain point, you can't just be like, "I believe this because my family told me to." You you have to be like. I, I'm going to decide for myself what I believe. And so, yeah, I think that's like a good thing to kind of go through that process. Hmm. You know, the funniest thing was, um, the funniest thing was we haven't, you ever heard of a uh, voodoo? Yeah. I keep, you know, I'm going to stop asking you that. I keep asking you the most basic shit and you know it already. <laughs> like, you, you know what chocolate is, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey, you know what, I, you know how to spell a, what, what is that even a question? But so, um, what was I gonna say? The funniest thing about meeting Brazilians is we have a thing in the United States called voodoo. And to my listeners, if you don't know what voodoo is, it's like this, it's like black magic from slavery. But in Brazil, they have the same thing. It's called condomble and macumba. And okay. they actually have like a, they actually have like a big religious following for it over there. It's kind of like, like, um, African religions mixed with Catholic, with the Catholic faith. Oh, uh huh. And it was kind of, that was one of the coolest things about seeing, talking to Brazilians, or even talking to people from, um, hell, any South Latin American country, seeing the parallels between our cultures and theirs. Like, even like, even like in the, even like in the church society, you know, actually, I don't know if they still have it, but the Brazilians that were there when I was there, they have like a little Bible study there every, every, every Wednesday. Are there even any more Brazilians there? Um, well, all of the ones that I knew went back to brazil but um, i cried I mean, oh man I cr- ooh. yeah oh man i cried man I, I mean i'm still in touch with them and stuff but yeah i i, I man december 2014 i cried so much that month when yeah, jonathan no. went back when jonathan lily uh well lily's not brazilian lily went back a few months after that but when John she might as well be Brazilian, though. I mean, like, yeah. all her friends are Brazilian, and she's been there. Her boyfriend was Brazilian, so yeah. <laughs> no homo. That was a good looking guy. I thought he was so. He was such a nice guy. I never got to meet him. I only saw pictures. But he's a really good. He was a really good guy. I remember one time. I remember one time. This is a really stupid story. Okay, there's a girl there. You might have met her. Her name. You, yeah, you might have met her. Um. You might have met her. I can't remember her name, but there was a. You remember Igor? He was uh, a yeah. really, yeah, really, yeah. really, really tall Brazilian guy. Really, yeah. really tall. There was a time we had a party. There was this Brazilian girl who came. I was trying to um, I peg out her, peg out her to get her. And so we were dancing and everything, you know, whatnot. And, you know, we started getting close. And I'm like, okay, I got her. 
And Bernardo, you remember Bernardo? Bernardo told me, he's like, hey, man, you should go back to the room and change because, you know, you're really sweaty. I was like, you know what? I should. I go back. I come back in 30 minutes. And Igor's kissing the girl. And I got so mad. I was like, oh, no. in my mind, I got so mad. I'm like, man, I hate this guy. Dang it. He messed up my night. This is supposed to be my night. I wear blue. I always get girls when I wear blue. And... <laughs> I went to your conversation club. This might have been, I think, the first time me and you had a conversation. I went to your conversation club. I think it was a Monday. I went there, and I saw him there. And you know I'm a friendly person, so even though I hate him at this yeah. point, I go talk to him. We talk. We end up leaving together, going to the bus stop together. I go back to, to uh, Vista Del Soto, my dorms. I talk to Bernardo about him. He's like, what do you think? I was like, you know what? Actually, I like that guy. If I was her, I would have kissed him, too. That's a really nice guy. <laughs> like, he, it's like... He would just, Man. It was like he. Was, I was like, "This is a really nice guy. I like this guy." I was like, "That was." I, there was a good choice. Like, if you get all the bad stuff out of the way first, and you come. Oh, okay. Jesus, Jesus. Okay. Yeah, there it is. Okay, air back. <laughs> okay, we're we're good now. Can you hear me? Yeah, we're good. Okay, yeah, but that's interesting. Yeah, that's I don't know. I just I just thought about that. I forgot what we were talking about. It made me talk about that. Oh, um, I don't know. Oh yeah, when everyone left and went back to Brazil, yeah. I miss I miss them so much. I, I think that's I think that might be a, I think that might be a trait of uh, Brazilians. They come here, steal your heart, and leave. Yeah, they're really good at stealing hearts. I, I like. It was funny because um, at my job, you know, we worked with a bunch of different people groups. And since we represented ASU, you know, like, we're not supposed to have preferences for different cultures or whatever. So, <laughs> I'm laughing <laughs> we already. We totally did. Like, you know, behind the scenes, everyone was like, oh, man, you got the you got all the Brazilians in your group. I wanted the Brazilians and stuff. And, like, everybody loved the Brazilians because they were just so much fun. They were just, so, they're, they're fun. They're social. They're really fun. to. They're a breath of fresh air. To have around you, you know, like you know, one thing about I think there's a stereotype of being an immigrant in this country that I think most Saudi Arabians have, that I think most Chinese people have, and that I think most most Asian cultures have, like of being kind of like very rigid and being nervous and being like I don't know what to say. And Brazilians aren't like that. Brazilians mm-hmm. are more social, they're more outgoing, they're more relaxed. You're like, okay, cool, I can fuck, excuse my language, I can mess with this, I like this, you know. Yeah. So it's, I mean, I guess, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just very warm. It's a very warm, bubbly feeling that you get from them. And I, that's one quality about them that I do miss. Yeah, yeah, me too. You know, I think, I think that's kind of, I don't know, I, I don't know, it's just, yeah, that, that kind of made me sad. Let, let's get off of something sad. But we're on actually on our last uh, twelve minutes of the podcast. We're actually on our last twelve minutes of the podcast. So I'm gonna get take this twelve okay. to get to uh, ask the random questions I've been thinking. What is the who is in that picture in the background right now? There is a picture that she has in her bedroom of two people who look like Charles. Who is that? Um, have you ever like? Did your family ever take pictures of you or like? They dressed you up in outfits that were like from a, from, oh. like a ago. Like they're like, "Oh, you look so cute, dressed as like a little farmer or whatever." <laughs> like <laughs> this, this picture, right? <laughs> That's what happens to my brothers. They're like in overalls with like fake fish, fishing rod and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> You look so cute dressed as a laborer. That is just so adorable. Yeah. You're just so cute dressed as a laborer making $6.79 an hour. That is cute. Yeah, that, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that's just the way I looked at it. I was like, that is, I mean, it's, 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 it looks cute. I mean, but it's, okay. That's one thing. Yeah. Second thing is, um, I'm trying to think of any of the questions I can ask. Once again, my if there's if there was two or three countries that you could want to go to, where would they be? If you could go to any country oh. in the world, um, I re- can't be can't can't be South America. Cannot be South America. Nowhere in South America uh, or Central America. <laughs> okay, you can do Central America. Okay, I really want to go to Costa Rica. Hmm. Um, so I mean, because 
I, it's got like this amazing like rainforest and stuff and they're like really peaceful country and like I don't know I, just like everything I read about them sounds really amazing um, and then let's see I, I want to go to Spain um, mm. that has a lot to do with like mainly like the food honestly <laughs> like I've heard so many good things about the food there but then also like the mixture of um, like Muslim culture and Catholic culture is super interesting too um, and like all the architecture there and stuff so there's that and then um, I mean it's hard to choose but I, I think I'd really like to go to India too if I could um, I don't know if that'll ever happen but um, what I really like about India is that they seem so unique you know they talk about India, they don't really call them Asians. Like, we kind of, even though they are Asian, we mm. kind of think of them as separate from the rest of Asia. Like, we lump the rest of Asia together, but then India is kind of like its own thing. Right. And, and I think that's kind of because, I mean, their culture just stands out so much. Like, it's so, so colorful and, you know, like... I don't know. It's just different. I, I love, like, for example, like, their wedding. Like, their wedding ceremonies with, you know... Um, like, uh, I'm, for some reason, I'm blanking on what, yeah, on henna, with henna. It, like, the henna thing is so cool. I love henna. And then, like, it's all colorful. Like, our, our weddings, everything is black and white. And theirs, it's just, like, all these bright, like, orange and red and pink and stuff. And I don't know. I just think it's it's great. It's funny because you keep saying colorful. And all I keep thinking of, the color means, the color men from Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, they were based off of Indians. I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe. I thought they were based off of the Turkish, but I, I really have no idea. I just thought, I just, well, I saw Kalamine, and I saw, like, the illustrations that they had with the big fluffy hats. I was like, well, I mean, after the making of the bad guys, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> if, yeah. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Um, ooh. This isn't very original, but probably flying. I'm the same I'm like, dude. No, I swear to I swear to you, I'm not joking. I choose that one all the time. I, yeah, okay. it would just be so fun. And like, I'm not athletic at all, so I can't even get like close to that experience by being like really good at running or something. Like, I've never experienced anything like that because I'm really not coordinated. So if I could just like flip a switch and be able to fly, that would be like. A dream come true. When you say you're not coordinated, is it because you don't like to play sports or have you tried to play sports and you just didn't do good at it? You know, I think it's kind of both because I never really tried until I was in high school. And that's like a lot of wasted time where I could have been developing skills, you know. So if I had started as a little kid, maybe I'd be okay. But even then, when I tried in high school, only because I had to, I was already like really shy about it. And I had to be on this basketball team. And I was, like, terrible at it. Like, I don't know. It's just, it's not something that comes naturally to me. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I like the idea of playing sports, but but I'm always too embarrassed at how bad I am. I, I ask that because I'm always somebody who likes to study the natural ability of somebody. Because, like, uh, Jesus, Jesus. Okay. 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 Um, You're back. I'm, I'm always somebody who likes to say the natural ability of somebody because, like, you know how in basketball, basketball is mostly tall people. Mm-hmm. You ever notice that you only know maybe you probably only really know two or three basketball players at the most? LeBron yeah. James, Michael Jordan. So really, what that told me theoretically is. Most of these guys who are on this court, at least 80%, probably ain't really all that good at basketball. They just happen to be really tall and are able to put the ball into the hole with slightly more accuracy than you can. Just slightly more accuracy than you can. But they happen to be tall, too, so that helps. So then when, yeah. you, so when you see that, it kind of makes you wonder. I don't know. Like, I, I like sports. I love, I love basketball. I'm not that good at it at all. I'm great at dancing, terrible at basketball. And I always used to, it always kind of makes me wonder how cool is it really being good at sports? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, when I was a kid, that was such an important thing. But then now I look at it and it's like, is it really that cool? 
Like, I don't know. This yeah, is... I think once you get, like, Uh, oh, meu São José. Oh. 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 I think once you, I think once you find something that you're really good at, or something that you're really passionate, about, can you hear me? Okay, we go. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think once you find something that you're you're good at or you're passionate about, you start really caring. Hey. I'm going to keep. Okay, here we go. I think when you sign, find something that you're really passionate about and you're good at, or I think you kind of stop caring about the things that you can't do good. I don't know. Maybe that's just a. I don't know. Can you still see me? Can you hear me anymore? <sighs> Gee, okay. Okay, I think I think that's when you start. When you find something that you're passionate about or something that you're good at, I think that's when you kind of stop caring about the things that you don't do good. Like, like I don't, I don't, yeah, I, yeah like, yeah. I don't care that I can't jump rope good. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, that kind of becomes irrelevant after like what sixth grade. <laughs> yeah, like so. Unless you're one of those people who does, who, unless you're one of those weird groups of people who does those meetup things where you get in like groups of 12 and jump rope somewhere. Oh, yeah. That stuff is cool, though. Okay, but man. I could never do it. Man, you never know. You never know. That's one thing you never Next need. time we talk, you, like, you can have me as a guest as like a world famous jump roper. <laughs> that would be so funny. Jessica the Jumper. Jumper, Jess- jump yeah. Jessica. Jessica, Jessica, jump! Dude! That can be your oh, teacher that's name. that's a better name, yeah. Jessica Jump. <laughs> Jessica Jump. I should change my name to that. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever thought about starting like a like a little YouTube series or something talking about your life? Actually, I have, but I kind of didn't want the, like, I don't know, I, since I'm doing graduate school right now, well, I didn't first, want to have first. to worry about, like, Oh, for first off, first off, before we continue this, let me just say this: people were going to have to cut the podcast short. Um, this is we're on our last hour. I've had this lady on here for two hours. She's tired. I'm probably not, but just because I like having a conversation with her. I wish I was in Arizona with her right now to have, meet up with her at Starbucks somewhere, but we cannot. But it was a pleasure talking to you, Jessica. Can you say uh, some little little bit of words to the people? Oh yeah, yeah. It was a pleasure for me too. Cool, cool. Um, it was great talking to you guys. This has been the late night episode of the People's Paradise Podcast. Uh, once again, tune in tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to be talking about the situation that happened in New Jersey. And then on the late night episode, we're going to have Mariana Hermont. She is somebody from Brazil. She's actually from the group of Brazilians that we were talking about just now. But oh, That's awesome. Yeah. Matter of fact, I might have a three. No, let me, let me stop trying to do too much. But anyways, but it's all-